Inescapably. 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 Inescapably foreign. Welcome to Without Borders. I'm your host, Nolan Yuma. If this is your first time tuning into the show, know that this is the show for immigrants, nomads, or refugees, or third culture kids, or anyone else that feels inescapably foreign. Today, I'm here with Aaron Deliosa. Uh, he's a host of the podcast, An Immigrant's Life which won the Canadian Ethnic Media Association Award for Journalistic Excellence for podcasting in 2022. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into his podcast and his objectives and everything like that. Uh, but to start it off, Aaron, how are you doing today, man? I am great. Thank you so much for having me, my man. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to have you on the show. I think uh, from the things I've heard on your podcast, I think we have a lot of overlapping objectives and, and interests. Um, so Aaron, you're, you're an immigrant yourself. Um, how long ago did you move away from the Philippines? Actually this year it will turn 20. So 20 it, I came here when I was 20 and now I'm living in Canada for 20 years. And where, where in Canada, just so the listeners know. Montreal, man, the greatest city in the world. <laughs> Why? Why is it the greatest city in the world? Cause it's the best. It's the, the I love Montreal, man. I'm like a number one fan of Montreal. I haven't traveled as vastly as you, but I have spoken to people that I've traveled. I've, and every time I listen to other podcasts, even like, I don't know, Rogan podcast or whatever, every time people talk about Montreal, they'll say it's the best. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't had the chance to go to Montreal yet. I should. Come by. I think it's the probably the cultural highlight of Canada. Uh, maybe I some people pissed off for me saying that, but I, I think so. No, dude. Hey, man, come at me. I'm ready, bro. <laughs> I was actually having a conversation with a friend about, like, the main cities in Canada, and he was born here, and he was saying, oh, you know, Vancouver and Toronto would be number one. I'm like, yo, 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 yo. I don't know about that, dude. I mean, I've been to Toronto. I love Toronto. I do. Vancouver, I was planning to come this year, but didn't work out. I don't know, dude. Montreal has that that spice, that flair, that European thing, you know, that those two doesn't have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of agree. Even though I haven't been to Montreal, just from what I hear and I've lived in Vancouver, mm -hmm. to me, it seems like Montreal is like the, the deep, sophisticated, diverse, um, <laughs> sibling. And then, uh, Vancouver is kind of the, the sexy, superficial sister. <laughs> yeah. The easygoing one, I feel like. Easy going to West Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I did superficial. I'm kind of hating on Vancouver right there, but I, I did love Vancouver for many things. I do like the West Coast culture. I'm a kombucha drinking, craft beer drinking kind of guy. Um, but at the same time, it gets a little bit tiring just the how expensive everything is. Just, uh, and it, 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 the conversations do get superficial. Like, I don't think you go a day without talking about housing prices. Oh, uh, yeah, I know Toronto's the same, Montreal, not so much. I that's one also I love of Montreal, it's a world class, world class country, however, it's still, it's still cheap, you know, in, in a sense, affordable. I mean. Yeah, especially with the amount of opportunities. That are yeah, I mean, yes, we have the French and the English um, political, you know, uh, conflict. But, hey, you know what, dude? There's no earthquake. There's no famine. There's no, you know, you're not avoiding gunshots. I'm good, Holmes. Yeah, there's minus 50. That's, that's it, I guess. Yeah. Well, now it's spring, so we're getting good now. What, what about making friends there? Because one thing that I've, heard is that Montreal is kind of like this brain drain, right? Like everyone goes there for some of the best universities. Well, one of the best universities in Canada, if not mm -hmm. the best, right? McGill and then one in the world, right? one of the top in the world, mm -hmm. right? Um, now I went to UBC, so I'm going to argue that UBC is just as good, but yeah. <laughs> UBC is good. UBC. McGill, McGill is great. And what I've heard is kind of a brain drain. Like people go there to study. They, they live their youth there. They enjoy the culture. And then they leave Montreal because, like, um, let's say Calgary pays a lot more. Mm. And then heading down south to the States, they pay a lot more. Have you noticed that a bit? Like, you meet younger people and then after a few years are gone? Or, first of all, I'm an old man. I'm not young anymore. But when I was younger, 
uh, yeah, people actually leave Montreal and then they'll say, I miss Montreal. But yes, to answer your question, yes, it has happened. We also have problems with uh, with doctors. Doctor leaves because, again, you need to be good in French and English. And some of pe- a lot of people doesn't want to deal with that. Also, the pay. It's the number one. Yeah, a lot of people leave because, you know, the pay is just it's not fair. You know, a lot of work for the equal pay, it, it doesn't make sense. But... Do you do you think because it's a little bit less expensive than let's say Toronto, less expensive than Vancouver, that it kind of evens out lifestyle wise, or not? I mean, yeah, that that does make sense in a sense, but I guess they always look for the like the 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 bag over the overall picture. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think that's what that's what they look. Hey, I'm not moving. I'm gonna be staying in Montreal till I die. Nice, man. Oh, I love how much of a fan you are. Uh, well, uh, I was going to get into this a little bit later, but let's get into it now. How mm-hmm. Canadian do you feel now? How Canadian? I, I always say I'm 50-50, like 50 Filipino, 50 Canadian. I, this is how I say it. My heart belongs in Canada. My soul belongs in the Philippines. Can you expand on that a bit? I, I feel it, but... In Canada, I love Canada. I love Montreal. I see, you know, people would be listening to this. I love it. Everything about it, you know, the the good and the bad. I always, I always choose Canada. But when I come home, and I have a chance to come home, the answer story speaks, and I just it has this feeling of. I, dude, I can't explain this. Okay, uh, like a few years ago, I went home the first time since, I don't know, I think it was 10 to 15 years since I came home. And, you know, being quote-unquote Canadian, I'm like, ah, Philippines, it's a place. I do miss a bit, but not really. I'm, you know, here now. I went home and I was, I was just, it was a beautiful night. Stars are out. You know what a tricycle is? Like the, the three-wheeled bike? Yeah, well, yeah. It's, a, it's a motorcycle. Three-wheeled, okay. three-wheeled motorcycle. So it's one in my in my in the Philippines. It's one of the uh, form of transportation if you're going to like close places, you know. And I was sitting in the back ride, which is the back part of the driver, and I was just like, like I'm up. I know I'm five, ten in a good day, and I was just like uh, bent over like this, and it's so uncomfortable position, and I'm sitting on a metal uh, metal part of the motorcycle. And I just look up, and I was looking at the sun and the, the moon and the stars, and I was like, I don't know. It was just like, I said, God, I miss this place. I love this place. And I said, like, I, it, and I also say it like, it's like seeing your ex-girlfriend that you love, that you broke up with, not because you don't love each other anymore, but because circumstances happened. Yeah, yeah. And you see her, she looks at you, you look at her, and she's like, she still got it. I get that, you know? Well, on on, some, on one of your shows, I, I did hear you once say that you never felt like you were born in the right country. Mm-hmm. Do you still feel that way, or is that kind of changing? Like, when you went back, did you feel, oh, maybe this is one of my countries? Yeah, I agree with that. Like, I think, I think it... Bro, I grew up poor. And we're talking about poor, poor. Third world country poor, you know? And I always had, I don't know, I always had that feeling. The way I think compared to the people that is surrounded around me, it was so different. And every time I watch or listen or read something Western, I agree more with the Western idea. So it made me feel like I don't think I was born in the right country, you know. I again, I love the Philippines. I'll never live back there, by the way. I'm just letting you know. So crazy, um, but I always had that feeling that that I don't feel like I was belong there. Again, when I go back, the ancestor speaks, and I do feel at home in that sense. But I would always still choose at least Canada. You know, I feel like Canada is my home. Well, then what are some of those things that you agree with when it comes to the Western perspective? Like you mentioned that 
growing up, you heard something about the West and you felt like you aligned with that a bit more. What what are some of those? Individualistic. Like mm. always, it, it always love yourself before you love others, right? In the Western, in the Eastern culture, it's always love your family first and then you can love yourself later. Yeah, yeah. A collectivism idea, which is great in a way, but, you know, I always believe that you have to love yourself first before you love each other, uh, other people. Like I was watching this when I was really young. I saw this Filipino show about this hero of the revolution in the Philippines against the Spanish. And he was saying, he was a blacksmith and he was saying, the, the whole town was saying that, okay, we need to fight. We need our arms to fight against the Spanish. And the blacksmith, who's one of the leaders in the town, says, no, dude, we need to eat first. We need to take care of ourselves first before we can fight. And I was like, yeah, that makes so much sense. If you're hungry, you're not fighting. You're dead. Yeah. So I've, I, I always grab on that idea, which I learned later, excuse me, the later on, that that's a westernized idea of, like, love yourself first and then love, your, love other people first. Again, second. And... I th what about I might butcher the pronunciation pronunciation here because mm. I don't speak Tagalog, mm. uh, but utang nalub. Oh, uh, I hate that this. <laughs> I hate utang nalub. So, so, so listeners know this is kind of like debt debt of obligation, mm. right? Emotionally debt, emotional debt. Okay, so what? Why do you hate this? Because you're never able to pay it. Because mm. let's say you, Nolan. One day, you need help. I don't know, monetarily, let's say. Most likely, it's monetarily. I'll, I'll give you money, right? And then you achieve whatever you need to achieve. You can pay me that amount of money, but I will always have that utang na loob over you. Because I will always tell you, Nolan, remember that moment you were dying and I saved you? Yeah, yeah. You'll never be able to pay it because it's emotional. How can you pay something emotional? Yeah. That doesn't, it doesn't, it's not uh, physical. I always, always, like, every time I talk to a family member or a friend, they're like, oh, you know, I have utang na loob to these people. Like, whoa, no. You did your job. That's equal. That's it. You move on. But oh, they always use it as a, a clout over you saying, like, hey, Nolan, you will always have utang na loob to me, and you'll never be better than me. Yeah, especially when, like, most Filipino culture, when someone uh, immigrates, let's say Canada, right? If I bring someone over, let's say a cousin or whoever, that person always had that utang na loob to me. I don't look at it that way, but culturally, that's how they look at it. And they will say, you can never be better than me because I brought you here. I made your life better. Yeah. I, on a personal level, I see that being difficult. And even on like a bigger scheme too, I read some opinions about how this could play a role in corruption as mm. well. Because having this the, this culture of utang, la, utang na lob, utang na lob, right? It's utang na lob, yeah. U utang na lob kind of could be part of why there's kind of like this national corruption. Because if you have to return the favors mm. all the time or someone's able to hold this over your head... Mm. That plays a big role in corruption. Do you, do you think that's true? Or hundred uh, percent, dude. Like I said, by the way, for the people that doesn't know, utang na loob is loosely translated to utang means debt. Nang is like off. Loob is like, um, like in not, loob is inside. It means inside. So debt inside it means like emotionally. So that's why you'll never pay for it, right? And never be able to pay it. And yeah, hundred percent because. Again, Nolan, you're running to be a mayor. I'm the governor. Nolan, I'm going to help you out. Nolan wins, and you'll be like, Nolan, remember that time you ran for mayor? So now you have to pay me. Right? Yeah. And then I'll have to pay someone above me, and it just continues and continues. Cronyism. Yeah, that's another way good put it. Wait. Yeah, you know, it's just... I don't know. It's just... I hate that it exists in... It's all. I wonder if it has a little bit of a Spanish influence too, because cronyism here in Spain we translate it to amiguismo, mm. and that's definitely how things work here as well. Now I don't think it's as strong as in the Philippines, but 
I mean, to work your way up in Spain, it does rely a bit on the connections and the circles that you're in and like returning favors. And I think that's even more prevalent in some places in Latin America. And you mm. just, you kind of see this in a lot of, well, places where corruption. Yeah, yeah, for up. sure. Like politically, yes, that's how it is. But I feel like Filipinos, we use it on low blade personally in the sense that it could be anything dude it could be like i don't know you your kids are you know dying of starvation i'll give you money over you're over dude you're like i had that over you for the rest of your life yeah well do you think there's any good sides to it the good side they're always a good side and bad side on things right yeah the good that's side. why i want to make sure we get into the good sides yeah so well. the good side is i I'll see that people are grateful to the person that helped them. Mm -hmm. uh, people are always humble that oh, Nolan helped me when I was uh, when I was you know struggling. So you always have that respect towards uh, extra extra respect to Nolan. That's you know thinking on top on top of my head. That's what I can think of like being grateful and being you know humble towards the person or people that helped you when you were struggling. Mm -hmm. And then another thing I think that can tie into this too is um, uh, pakikisama. Mm -hmm. I guess would would you translate it as not rocking the boat? Pakikisama. A little bit, yeah. I'll see that because you have to. It's. I look at it as a um, tribe mentality. Okay, you cannot. There's a circle. You cannot get out of the circle because you're gonna stand out, right? And this is normal to mostly conservative culturally nation and cultures and that you cannot be better than us because we're in a circle and yeah Pakitam again positive great you, you know as the um, the um, African saying if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go lot further go together right which is great but sometimes you want to do your own thing yeah you know? But no, again, utang lalo, pakikasama, you have to, oh, the group, help me out, I need to be with them. And one thing, I'll bring it to um, to a personal level. I played basketball, because, you know, Filipinos play basketball. Huh? And we will join the group, we will join a team, and we're pretty good, so we will make, we'll be 15 players, but always we only end up playing eight people. The rest are not playing. But when it's playoffs time or finals time, because it's time to shine, people that doesn't play will suddenly start playing. And I always tell my teammate, like, you, they cannot do this. It's not fair for them to just jump into our hard work. And it yeah. will mess up the chemistry. And then they'll say, well, you know, Pakikisama, you have to be like, well, they came like, I don't care, dude. I'll give them their money. Yeah. They didn't even work for this, but they want to get that flame, that clout. Oh, I hate it. I quit the team after a few times. Like, I cannot set up myself for a heartbreak every time. Because this is, I cannot control. I can control the idea of me playing well and you guys are playing well. But the idea of them just joining in and ruining the chemistry, no way, homie. I was like, okay, one more year. And then that's it. And then it happened again. And like, okay, I'm done. So what is the difference then between the, the Pakikisama and then Hia, like the, the idea of shame and losing face? Are they related at all or is it different? I would say they're touching a little bit. You know, there's a, um, what's the word for, uh, for it? Like there's a dichotomy between the two, right? It, they're, all, they're interconnected. Hia is like, oh, um, let's say I owe you money. Right, mm -hmm. and I'm always ashamed towards you because because I owe you money. But and then if you Nolan wants to do something that I'm against with, whatever it is, you know, like going out to party or something big. Because I have the hiya, and then the pakikisama, I have to go with you because I need to, you know, makikisama. That's the word makikisama with you. And it just, you, it, 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 it'll make you do things that you don't want to do. Because I feel I'm trying to save face with you or the culture or, or the community. Yeah, that makes sense to me. 
And I guess this also ties into that Filipinos aren't confrontational. Mm. I don't I don't know how accurate it is, but if you look at some of the the business research when it comes to cultural psychology and a lot of this business research, it's kind of flawed because they, they do it in a business setting, mm. which means that they're looking at a certain socioeconomic background. They're mm-hmm. looking at, you know, s- a certain culture within those cultures. Um, but it does seem like Philip, like the Philippines is very far on the side of avoids confrontation. A hundred percent. That's the Asian thing, right? Like um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, the his book, uh, 10,000, what's the book? I'm terrible with. I'm I'm good at reading books. I always forget the name. Uh the one the ten thousand hours one. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yes. Um, that escapes me right now too. Uh, outlier, outlier. So there's a part of the book they're showing uh Koreans pilots, and the Korean airlines crashes all the time, and they couldn't figure it out. It's like people are dying, so they hired people over. Uh, a westernized, western, uh, uh, like, I don't know, a director or something, and he studied it. And he figured out that the co-pilot respect the pilot so much that even though the pilot's going to do something dangerous, he respect him so much that he won't even say anything. That also comes into the hierarchy culture. Exactly. So yeah. it's pretty much the same idea that Anyways, to, to finish the, the Korean story, the Korean airline story, they forced the, the pilots, the co-pilots say, hey, if it's going to make a decision that it's going to kill you all, you got to make a, you got to speak up. So it's, it's pretty much the same, the hierarchy. We're very hierarchical ideas. If we're very like, if someone gets a little bit of power, bro, bro, that person will take it like to a la max. And... Do you feel like you used to agree with it at all, or were you just kind of born not agreeing with that? I think I was born not agreeing with that. Like I nice. always get, I always get in trouble. I always get in trouble. My grandma was always a lover, rest in peace. She always like gets mad at me with that. But I'm, I, I was grateful too with my family because they allowed it. They allowed me to be me. They're like, yeah, that's just him. He says crazy shit. Now. What what was it like for you coming to Canada at first? Did you feel like people there were confrontational? Because I think we might have different experiences here. Because m- like my parents, um, well, my mom is Argentinian and Belgium. My dad's uh, from Belgium, mm. and Belgians aren't quite as confrontational as the Dutch. But I think my parents are quite. <laughs> they're probably won't like hearing this, but they're more Dutch when it comes to confrontation. Like they're really straight up mm. with negative feedback and everything. Mm. And then when they moved to Canada. Um, because Canadians are quite friendly and everything too, even though they're like, if you look at the entire world, they're, I think a little bit more on the confrontational side, but they're less confrontational than Dutch for sure. And so my parents, when they heard like, um, how, how they would speak to people, they always thought, okay, here we have a friendship. This person really likes me. And then afterwards they would hear like, oh, behind their backs, those people had a completely different opinion among my parents than what they said in front of their faces. And it was really difficult for my parents to adapt to that in Canada because mm-hmm. they found the Canadians like opposite of confrontational, that they mm-hmm. would like avoid telling the truth in mm-hmm. front of their faces. Was it the opposite for you at all or? The, you mean like confrontational wise? Yeah. Like, did you feel Canadians were confrontational then compared to to your background or do you feel like Canadians are also also avoid confrontation I think they avoid confrontation I think it's passive aggressiveness yeah, yeah. I, I think that came from Br- British you know you know the Brits right they'll say like they, they have this way of saying things that is not really confrontational but if you dissect it you'll see oh he's they're saying something yeah yeah, you know? I, I wish I could quote it exactly because you brought up the airlines, but there's another example with that with the British airlines and the captain says something like, I don't know exactly what it was, but something like, um, everyone, you have m- much reason to remain calm. We are about to land. Uh, we are about to go down. None of the engines are working. So please remain in your seats. And it was just like, <laughs> instead of... You know, it was kind of like wrap it around the... Yeah, that's what they, that's what they do. They like... It's a great way, but yeah, 
going back to your question, no, I didn't feel confrontational. Obviously, there's uh, some cultural differences, meaning that in the Philippines, if you're a worker, you have to call your boss sir or ma'am. Is just a thing. Is you have to show respect again, hierarchical, right? And with that, they always say most of the people. Oh, I'm not your boss, because we always say boss too, like boss. We even like we even call random people, random men, usually men, in the street, like oh boss, uh, where is the library or whatever, you know? So no, I didn't find that. There's some little things. No, I always I found them more um, more accepting, you know. That's one thing I like more welcoming. Confrontational, not so much. Again, it's the British way. Some of them, in general, by the way, obviously. But no, I didn't find them more confrontational. But we Filipinos are the best with not confronting people, man. We're the <laughs> best at the shit. We're like the Michael Jordan of that, you know. We'll just talk shit behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, do you think this ties in in any ways with political correctness? Like nowadays in Canada too, right? I think mm. the kind of like political correct language kind of gets pushed a little bit more, especially in, in certain circles, like in the universities and stuff. Do you think Filipinos might adapt quicker to using this politically correct language because they don't want to offend people? Or is there kind of a difference here between being politically correct and not wanting to offend people no i don't think i think they're both different because trust me you come to my family and you start gaining weight they will call you and on that be like nolan you know you it means like you're getting fat yeah there's no political correctness in our culture you know we would not confront you in let's say uh let's say nolan is being too confident like they'll say uh, you're too being confident. You're arrogant. They'll never say that. But if you start gaining weight, hmm, they will let you know. Yeah. You know, little things like that. Even my wife is Canadian. So when we started dating, I told her, I was like, the first time I, she's going to meet the family, like, listen, by the way, they were going to feed you so much that your belly is going to explode. And then eventually they'll call you fat. That's how they are. <laughs> and then after calling you fat, they will say, did you eat? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a crazy mentality, you know? To be honest, I love it. I, th I think it's pretty fun. Yeah, but, but I, like I said, like I told her, I said, it's, they not, they're not trying to be mean. They're just saying, you are gaining weight. You know, it, 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 it's a fact. Also, we also <clears throat> equate that to, I'm taking care of her. I'm feeding her. Because, you know, back in the days, some culture, they if you are chubby or fat, they'll know that you have money because you can eat, you know. But yeah, confrontational, no, not not really. I don't, I don't, I don't think they're together. Or yeah. I mean, like political correctness. I mean, I no, we don't have problem with that. Trust me, we're gonna tell you what's up. Oh, good to know because I think I think that's something people have to be aware of. Is sometimes. Uh, trying not to offend people doesn't really correlate with how straight up you are with language. Because right? I think a lot of the time, especially in North America and in the West, we spend so much time nowadays talking about like which words you're not allowed to use and how you're supposed to say things. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't really mean that you're mm, not confrontational. No. It, there, There is a separation there. Yeah, they, we, we, we will use words that are like, you know, like, you can take it out if you want to, but in the Filipino, which is in Spanish, negro means black. Mm -hmm. That's why we use the word. There's no, like we're, there's another word, but we use that for itim is it black, the, but that's for the color of let's say a microphone or a wall or whatever. But if we're talking about a black person, we'll say negro. That doesn't in mean it's probably from the Spanish. Exactly, but that doesn't mean the N word in in in, in American. That's mm -hmm. just how it is. We're not trying, of course, we're very respectful people, but we don't do the political correctness thing. Yeah. And, well, how do you feel about that personally? Do you feel a little bit more Canadian? Like, do you feel like we should be limiting our language? Or do you do you kind of more align with the Filipino way here? Like, oh, let's just use the word um, and not beat around the bush. Yeah, that's, that's me. 
I, I will use the word that that exactly that exactly uh, explains what I'm trying to talk about or is, say to you. I don't no. do the I don't I don't do the mixed like. Oh well, you know, uh, I I don't I can't think of anything. Okay, great, great example, retarded, right? Mm. I will never ever ever call a person that has mentally challenged the, that word. I won't, right? But I'll use that word anyway, in the yeah. sense that like, that's a retarded move. But I'll never call, use that word for a mentally challenged person. Yeah, you know, I have family members that are that are mentally challenged. I'll never call them that word. But I'll still use that word. Why? Why are you stopping me to use that word? <laughs> you know, I I don't believe in muting words. Exactly, man. I I agree with you. Like I think a lot of these people kind of advocating for this language control. They frame it as a way that they're trying to protect marginalized groups and limit racism. Mm. But really, most of the people I hear that are really advocates of this are people from upper middle class backgrounds that went to elite universities. Mm -hmm. And then they they get these jobs in these think tanks. They get these and so because they have these elite um, this elite status, they get mm. on the news, they get on the the media and then they're able to kind of like push this message like this is how we're going to help the people mm -hmm. but to me it seems like they're completely out of touch with immigrants and refugees and marginalized groups mm -hmm. because they've just been in these elite little circles the whole time mm -hmm. and they're just sharing each other's peer-reviewed articles and if they like from from my experience with this podcast and also like listening to your podcast as well a lot of the time these marginalized groups and everything they don't give a shit about the language they give a shit about the stuff that's actually going on like on one of uh on one of your podcasts the the person asks something like oh what is the word i'm supposed to use for this country and you're like the words developing nation but bro let's just be real it's a poor country <laughs> <laughs> that's the filipino in me you know, I don't like, oh, it's supposed to be a developing, bro, it's a third world country. We're poor. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. You know, but going back to your point about these people that gets into this think tank, I just had, uh, I had a friend that calls homeless people and house people. And I'm like, bro, what the, f like, who said this shit? By the way, I'm sorry. I'm swearing. Oh, dude, you could swear. Uh, that's all. Well, okay. Like, and house. I'm like, who said this shit? This did the homeless people say that they're an house people? I don't think so, because they're busy looking for food. Yeah, you know, like, well, you know, we don't want to argue. I'm like, listen, dude, you say whatever you want to say. I'm gonna say homeless, because they are homeless. You know, mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't adhere to those. Like, oh, don't call them that because no. I'm not doing that unless I see personally that yeah I think that's hurtful, and then I'll move and then I'll change my uh, my uh, my word. But homeless and house, it's the same thing. You're just making it fancy and house. What do you mean and house? What like, what is it? A turtle? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so yeah, now now we're kind of getting into some of the the size or. Besides where you feel a little bit more Filipino, we've kind of covered how you feel a little bit more Canadian. Mm -hmm. Anything else that was a challenge for you when you had to acculturate to Canada? Uh, none really, because I was very, again, like living in the Philippines, I was like, my mentality was westernized already. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're, you know, finding new friends. Oh, dude, that's, because uh... I'm very introvert. I'm a very private person. And... Even in the Philippines, I'm very like, I don't look for friends. Friends just somehow meets me and then we become friends. In the Philippines, when I, before I move, I will never leave my house without one or two person with me. There's always pakikisama, you know, there's always someone with me. I got here, there was no one, dude. <laughs> I was, you know, homesick, you know, I, I miss my friends, I miss people. But that's the only part, and it was hard for me being an introvert, like going out and say, "Hey, can let's hang out." 
And the first person that I asked to hang out with, he said, no, I'm busy. And then I found out he, he wasn't busy. Because I was like, ah, oh, you. Nah. But eventually I found my people, I found friends, and that's it. And I, again, growing up in the Philippines, I have, I have this idea of barcada. Barcada, me, barcada means a group of friends. That's what it means. It's a street name, a street word. I don't understand. I don't really know the etymology of the word, but that's that's the word, barcada. I always had the idea, I have to have barcada to be happy. And then I realized, actually, no. I need one or two, maybe five people that are even separate, for, and that's good for me. So I had to shift my idea with that, that I'm okay without a group of friends, you know. But yeah, other than that, to answer your question, no, I'm, I, I was pretty all right. And did you experience any racism or did your family? Mm. And not me. Okay, I don't know if this is racism, but one time I was getting gas. And it's one of those gas stations that there's only one pump. So I park and then I see the other car park on the other side. And I grab the the the... What do you call this? The pump, I guess, to put the gas. And I, I guess I was like a few seconds ahead from the guy, which is the man who was a, he was a Caucasian, um, uh, Quebecois, which is a, a person to speak French in Quebec. I grab it and he started getting mad. And like, oh, I was here before you, this and that. I'm like, oh, so me, I'm very respectful. I said, I'm sorry, sir, I was here before you. If you were here before me, you would have gotten it, right? And I would have given it to you. And he was getting mad, and then he said something like, like, oh, you people come here. Mm-hmm. And so me, I don't know what he means by that. He, does he mean me an, as an immigrant or me as a brown person? I don't know. That's one. Either way, it's prejudice. Like, uh, yeah, you know, but I'm easy going with prejudice. It actually, racism actually makes me laugh because it's so dumb. It's dumb. Like, why? What? It doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm lying. There was one time I got, there was one time that I felt I was judged for what I, how I look. But it wasn't from a white person. It was from a black person. So a friend of mine who's a uh, black woman, she were very close and we went to see her family. And she's very close to me. I was close to her. But she's more like, She's very touchy-feely with me. Like, she always hugs me and kisses me on the cheeks or whatever. So she introduced me to her family, and she said, oh, this is my boyfriend. As a joke, and one of her aunt got mad, like, oh, not with a Chinaman. Oh, no. <laughs> and I was, I was really deeply offended in a sense, like... You're, you're black, I'm brown. Like, we should be, to, like, we should be friends. You know, like, you should not be racist towards me. And you know, I mean, I'm not saying, like, racism is good, but you know what I mean? Like, we have the same struggles. We're both marginalized people. Why are you doing this to me? I just, you know, again, uh, water off of my back, but it's one of the things that, like, what the, what just happened? But other than that, not really. My family, my mom, no, my dad, no, no not really. One time I remember my mom, there was this group of kids that threw an egg at my mom because it was uh, Halloween. I think it's a... Okay. That's Halloween though, right? I, yeah, yeah, but uh, not sorry. really. Nothing. And But what about more like the systemic racism, right? So not people being assholes explicitly and saying horrible terms or doing shitty things, but more that systemic racism where you've noticed it was harder for your mom to get a job or it was harder for you to get a job in a certain way. Did, did, do you think that happens in Canada, or do you think in Canada it, it's pretty good in that sense? It's because I don't it, know because I'm a white guy. So. It's pretty good, but I know and I don't focus on that. I always say to myself, like, if there's a job or what needs to get done, I will get it done. What the other people think towards me is none of my business. I will just do my job. If they get it, if I can get the job, I get the job. If I don't get the job, hey, let's move on, huh? However, I know this for a fact because a friend of mine used to work with this gentleman who is, I'd say, white looking. And apparently, my friend told me that every time 
a person passes a CV to this guy, once he sees it's not, you know, French sounding or a Western look sounding, in the garbage straight goes to. I'm like, no, no, not not French sounding. French sounding is like, but he also chuck away the English name. Like, what if no, no, he gets it English. If it's not Westernized, you know, like I know Smith or whatever, you know, like because I know in Quebec there are some like people that hate the the English, like the mm. uh, the people who speak English, right? So they'll just... <laughs> no, no, he's good as long as it's Westernized. They like like Deliosa, gone. That's not gonna happen, you know. And so it does happen. I'm sure it happened, but again. I had a I had a friend that he has so much problems with oh I'm not getting my job that I want because I'm excuse me for the term but this is what he used it, goop I'm a goop he says and like doesn't matter dude like do your job you know and he says because I'm not white I'm not tall enough you know I'm Asian that's why no one likes me and I said dude. I'm in a province that speaks two languages. That the other language, that is main language, I barely speaks, and I'm doing okay. What's the problem? You know, I don't, I don't adhere to that. Now, my again, shout out to my grandma, rest in peace. She always says, "Just do your job, bro." Yeah, yeah. you know, it's a just do your job, and whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Well, when we're talking about do just do your job. When I heard a little bit about your story and just a lot of Filipinos, Filipinos work hard as fuck, <laughs> right? Um, so let's get a little bit of, into that about your mom's story because that was one of the main inspirations for your podcast, right? Your mother? Yep. Um, so you only saw her once every two years? Correct. For a month. And and so for how long was that that you would only see her once every two years? From eight years old to I would say since I moved here in Canada, so I was twenty. So from eight to twenty, no mom. We 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 see her once a month. I don't. I think I saw her one Christmas time during those time, maybe once. I think graduation, birthday, Christmas, New Year. It doesn't matter. Mommy got to work. And what was she doing at the time? She, you know, typical Filipino. She's a domestic helper, as they say. Really, cleaning lady. You know. But where was she working? She was working in Hong Kong it, because it was the, it was like, I think she had a, we had a family member that worked in Hong Kong. And my mom, man, that, that woman's the goat, bro. Like, I will put that woman against all the moms. And she's probably... Mount Rushmore, you know, because the thing that she did, it was insane. It, like from poor to what we are now, it's all her. We literally didn't do anything. She did everything. And she was, you know, she was, she was telling me that she was doing three jobs every day. She barely take a day off because, you know, we, we, she wanted us for us to have a better life. And she didn't stop, dude. She did not stop. And I never hated that. I never hated her for it. that. Even the worst time, even the tough times, never. Because I knew there's a there's a goal. And to get that goal, we need to do, make a sacrifice. And again, shout out to my grandma. Thankfully for her and my aunt, they kept us. They took care of us to the best of their ability, even though we got whooped. <laughs> um... Yeah, it helped so much that we achieved our goal. And in my head, there was no doubt we were reaching that goal. No doubt. It was 100% it's going to happen. I don't know how, but I knew it's going to happen. Yeah. And one thing I, that ties into with your mother, um, I heard you say that you you consider the Philippines a matriarchal society. Mm. Yes, it is. Because it's the women that go off and work a lot of the time. That's right. And the household is run by women. The woman makes the decision. So what do the men do? We bring the money. That's what we do. We bring the money and then they make sure everything's good in the hood. It's like uh, a great example. We have this term called commander. It means commander. So that's how we call our women. 
<laughs> the commander? Yeah, because <laughs> they're the boss, you know? So we just made it Filipino commander. Or there's another term called Andres de Saya. It means literally a person named Andres under the, under the wife's dress because she's afraid of the woman. You'll never hear a term about like a man that afraid that a woman afraid of the man. No, you will not hear that. But we always have terms about men scared of women. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, we we're like <laughs> that's one thing I love about our our uh, our culture is like we look at each other as equals in a sense of that. That there's this thing that going back about uh, political correctness, uh, people are saying you know. Oh, there is this uh, what do you call it? The 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 a job is specific for men and women only. Oh yeah, I forgot the yeah. term. I mean, so what? That's the that person is the best for doing that. We're not saying though that the woman cannot do it. Of course, they can do some jobs that men can do, but they're better with that than imagine a man taking care of the house, cleaning and everything. It, you know what I mean? Like, we can do it, but the women, they got that touch, that beautifying oh, touch. In my household, the gender roles are swapped. I'm the one that cleans the most. I'm the one that cooks. And then my partner, she's the one that fixes everything. If it's broken, <laughs> does everything with mechanics. <laughs> well, there you go. See, there's still a there's still a dis distinction that, oh, this woman, she's good at this. That's what she does. Yeah. But you, or you're good at these things, you, good, you do that. But... As a general, general speaking, uh, my culture is usually the man will take care of like quote unquote manly things, and the women will take care of the woman things. Also, it's not the it didn't work out well, but still, I would like to say that the Philippines is the first republic that ever voted a woman president. I didn't know that. Yeah, so it was Corazon Aquino. It wasn't a great thing to happen, but it's a it's something that is good. Do you know what I mean? What happened? Corruption. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was chaos. She was not a good pol up. She was not actually a politician. They just uh, the dictator uh, Marcos, the original. Uh, he he had a he had a fight with the the husband of Corazon Aquino, who is Nino Aquino, and they assa he got assassinated. The people. That was running the show said, "Oh, why don't we make her run for the office of the president?" And we'll say we use the emotional, you know, the emotional uh, dr drive to get her into office, and she did win. She, there is no doubt she's not gonna win. Because who are you gonna choose, the dictator over her? Who is gonna choose the woman? She's not the best, but you know, lesser evil, I guess. I don't know, but yeah. And we have voted another woman in office. But again, it you know again corruption still going. But yeah, going back to our topic that uh, we're Western, uh, we are matriarchal. Yeah, hundred percent matriarchal. Again, commander. And but w even on the hierarchy, like let's with say, so it sounds within the hierarchy within families, the mm -hmm. woman is the boss. Are there any situations where the man has to have more respect or is it always the woman that is is on the top of the ladder i think this is the colonial idea of when the spanish came this is when it changes that okay the guys has to be in the position of power and like offices like political offices and whatnot but because if you really dissect if you go to the the indigenous, which where I lived, there were indigenous people. They're pretty much, you know, like uh, leveled. Like there's no chief. Like I, we have our main chief in the original pre-colonial. We have the lady, uh, our priestess is called Babaylan. It's a woman. She's the one who cures everything, takes care of everything. Um, so the chief, there's not much really chief but yeah it, so the chief was always a woman mm, she's not really a woman she's not really the chief but okay the, the chief is a man but the babaylan is stronger like she's not the leader but everybody listens to her did it also depend because like i know there were many indo-malay 
tribal sediment settlement across the Philippines, right? Mm. Then the Chinese mercantile empires came, then the Spanish cl- colonialization. Um, but were there a lot of differences depending on the Indo-Malay tribal uh, settlements? Like, did were there some more that were more matriarchal, some that weren't? Not or... th- that I know of. No, it's always balance. It's always just the Babaylan, and then there's the chief. The da- the datu, the the men will always get the main office, kind of, as you say, but there's always that position, the Babaylan, which pulls more power actually, because it's closer to the community, you know. Um, again, when the Spanish came, then like, hey, men, number one. I was actually having a conversation with a cousin about this. Uh, the prayer, uh, uh, what do you call it? Hail Mary, right? In Filipino, we say it, Aba Ginoong Maria. Means, Aba means to show respect, Ginoong means um, um, Mr. And then Maria, which is Mother Mary in Catholic. Why Why, we, why is it Ginoong instead of Ginang? Ginang is the female, right? Yeah. Because of the Spanish. They always make sure that the male is the is the main, the top, the alpha, yeah. you know? But so now I start to change it. I say, Abagina Ang Maria. Ah, nice. Yeah, nice. You know, I try to correct those little things. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Well, breaking those things ties into something uh, that I was looking up before this, and it's Filipino psychology. And I didn't know it was a thing until I started preparing for, for our conversation. Have you mm. heard about Filipino psychology? Not really. Not, not okay, not. So it, apparently it was form. I'll, I'll read a little bit what I have here. It was formalized in 1975, and it was against the psychology that promotes the colonial mentality. Um, and then it, it involves like searching for local equivalents for commonly used psychological uh, concepts and then the indigenization from within this process in which the knowledge and methods related to psychology are derived from the local culture. Now, I don't want to get into a whole lesson here, but mm. what it pretty much all came down to was that the the um, the Filipino culture before col- colonialization was so much more about groupthink mm. and, um, as you mentioned, also more about the matriarchal cultures and just thinking of each other as equals, um, which we kind of talked about at the beginning of the podcast as well. So do, do you think that this is is coming back now or what do you mean like which one coming back like like this this idea of um well decolonization right so kind of getting rid of all these values that the spanish i'm trying to do that now myself personally you know Uh i'm trying to of course i'm always trying to understand that colonization brought positive thing as well you know i but yes, I see that more and more. Um, the Baibayan, which is the old script, the way we write, was eradicated by the Spanish to replace by the Roman letters. I'm trying to learn that. I'm trying to work on that. Um, I'm trying to learn and to speak and write in Filipino more or Tagalog. Because I'm a Tagalog. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it I, I see it more and more. I I but however I see it more of the diaspora happening more than the main the country. I feel like the country is still moving is still uh colonized hard now, especially the uh, Korean uh, the pop Korean people. Like they they I think we need more education. There there have been a group of people that trying to bring back teaching of by buy-in and it's really hard because you know it's an old way people was like why we have this already but it's our culture it's this is our people this is our thing this is what makes us us so it's a hard battle but yes i've seen a lot of people and one of the people that propagates this is christian kabuai he's the one who makes it "Quote unquote cool again to write by buy-in, learn by buy-in. It's a great, beautiful letters, 
beautiful characters and uh, just even also mentality again like me i personally i tell people stop with the utang na loob stop with um um well uh, oh the, the colorism uh stop with the, the nose thing uh what's the nose thing for the people that doesn't know your nose bro them girls will love them nose because it's sharp <laughs> right like we say matangos it's sharp my nose is flat and white, you know, this is not good. This nose, no bueno. <laughs> the girls will choose you over because you're white, obviously. You're, uh, they'll call you Canuck, means American, even though you're not American. They'll just call you that. Uh, like little things like that. The people will, or people, even my family would say, like, oh, uh, Nolan is good looking because he's white. I'm like, no, he's not. He's, he's good looking because he's good looking, not because he's white. Yes, it helps that he's white, but doesn't mean his white automatically means good looking yeah you know little, little things like that. personally i'm trying to you know educate myself educate my people um what about for tourists or digital nomads that go to the philippines is there anything that they can do to kind of support this decolonization or is this kind of just out like the, the tourists should kind of just stay out of it or is there anything they can do in the way that they travel to make sure that they're not supporting like this old colonization? Yeah, stop doing those stupid TikTok things that they're making fun of my culture. I hate that shit, dude. Like, oh, in the Philippines, this is how they call people. Psst, psst. Like, yo, you're not helping our culture. You're getting the likes. I want you to show the culture. I want you to show how we write, the clothing that we use, the, how lovely we are, how how giving we are we could be bro if you go to a filipino house they'll be the poorest of the poor they will make sure you eat well you know they will borrow money they will get utang na loob from other people just to feed you okay that's what i want to see that's i want to see that i don't want to see those like in the philippines this is how they call people or in the philippines this is how they eat in the sense that that um uh, making fun of it, it, it um What's the word? Um, I forgot the word. Um, fetishes. Yeah, fetishes? Fe fetishes? Yeah, fetishizes it. I, enough with that. Even yeah. even pro other Filipinos that does it. I hate that. Like, we are more than that. We are more than that. We have a culture that we need to propagate. We need to show the people, this is us. Enough with this, like, you know, oh, in the Philippines, they'll pe beat you up. Every culture gets beat up. Every kid gets beat up. We're not that. We're more than that. You know? Yeah. Uh, for the, again, going back to your question. Yeah, like I said, if you are a digital nomad and you're a different culture, show the beauty of the Philippines. Show the culture. Show the day-to-day. -day, how we live. How we, you know, how we deal with people. How we, how we embrace other culture. That's one thing we, I also proud of the Philippines is we embrace culture like that we we if whatever you're negative whatever you're how you are we will accept it we will never force you to accept our culture we will not do that however we would love to rest for you to respect it you know okay. good uh, now to tie this into your podcast a little bit and just podcasting in general and this kind of goes into being a digital nomad because of course you could be a digital nomad with a podcast if, if you're making a living with mm -hmm. it. And something that I struggle with with my podcast, and I don't know if you struggle with it at all, is but you just brought up this idea of TikTok and Instagram and these little slices of information mm -hmm. to attract people or to entertain people. When it comes to culture, it's the worst. And like I do it. I I try and make these little clips and I, I make little posts because I want to attract people to the longer forms mm. that I have here. You know, the longer podcasts, my long mm. articles. And then I make these little snippets in the hope that it will attract people. But I know that like 99% of the time, it's not attracting people to the longer form stuff. And mm. all I'm doing is I'm just adding to this mentality of just like quick snippets of information mm. and it's especially dangerous when it comes to culture because culture can never be understood with just like one snippet of information because yes it might be true in that one context but you have to read and you have to talk to people about everything that's around it 
Um, how do you deal with it with, with your podcast and trying to promote yours? I just approach it as art. I will create something. I enjoy what I do. I, I, I'm sure you check my my Instagram. I make these audio reels. And I approach them as art. I create art. Now, if it brings people to my podcast, amazing. If it doesn't, what are they going to do? You know? Mm-hmm. I And you saying that it's... Um, it's helping the idea of uh, quick click, quick, uh, quick click, or quick click, click bait, and click bait. To... Hey, that's the name of the game. Yeah, it's either you get on the game or you get off the game. You can't change the rules. That's the rule. Yeah. You know, you just have to let it go and be be at peace with it. That that's the rule of the game. You cannot play basketball and then expect it will be soccer. It, it doesn't work that way, you know? <laughs> so, again, I always, when I start the podcast, up to now, up to however, how long it lasts, I approach it as art. When I make something, when I make a post, I spend time on that thing, dude. I always think of the every curvature, every font, every placement of the font, every color scheme, I think of that. Audio reels. I don't care if... Hey, listen, if it goes viral and brings me money, don't get me wrong. That would be amazing. Yeah. But, you know, Picasso didn't draw expecting he'll get money. He drew because that's what his soul says. Look, you follow it. He followed it. That's what I do. I make art. I like to call it art. I make the art. And if people like it, awesome. If people doesn't like it, no, it's okay. I'm never going to do the, hey, in Philippines, this is what we do. To get mm-hmm. clicks, get out of here, dude. I like this shit. I like talking. I like getting to know people. I like, again, like, like you said, expanding ideas. What does, I don't know, uh, like, what the love means? Let's expand that. Because you can cut that to a snippet of an audio, but well, you're missing the rest of it. Now, again, it's on the people. If they're going to click, if they're going to listen, awesome. If not, hey, c'est la vie. Yeah. Aaron, I love that, man. And I hope a lot of the listeners, I hope that motivates people to listen to your show as well. Thank you. Uh, we're we're, all, we're at an hour here already. Mm-hmm. So Aaron, anything else you want to bring up about your show before we end this about the immigrant's life? Of course, man. If you guys want to listen to me rambling and talking to cool people and hoping they'll send me food, my podcast is An Immigrant's Life Podcast, a storytelling, storytelling podcast about relation, people's relationship with immigrants. And it's like uh, Nolan's uh, podcast, but pretty much the same. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of my podcast. I, like I, you mentioned on the top, which I really do appreciate that I won, well, the podcast won the award for uh, Canadian Ethnic, which I didn't expect. Shout out to Franklin Rodriguez, my brother, for nominating me. Dude, when they got me, when they called me, that I was like nominated, like I'm close to the the top nominate. I'm like, in my head, like why, you know? And then they finally called me saying I won. I'm like, in my head says why? I why why not because I don't deserve it. But like going back earlier, you said that that uh, political correctness. A lot of people on TikTok, social media, they propagate this idea of. Um, hey, uh, unhoused people are not housed. You should change, you know, like political correctness. I hate mm-hmm. that shit. I, it's so fake for me. Yeah. That's what I mean. Like in my, on my podcast, if you listen to it, I do not do that. I'm like, fellow country, poor country. You know, I get to the, get to the point. Um, I, I'm rambling here, but yeah, I, I don't think I, I just listen to my podcast. If you want to listen. And Matt. thank you so much, Nolan, for having me. It's and such a pleasure. Yeah, man, Aaron, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Um, again, I encourage everyone to listen to The Immigrant's Life. If you like Without Borders, I think you'll love The Immigrant's Life. As you can see, Aaron and I share a lot of the same values. Of course, have very different backgrounds, so you'll get a lot of different perspectives still. And uh, remember, if you want to support this show, go to www.withoutborders.fyi. I also share a bunch of articles about cultural psychology there, cultural competence, and then I tell a lot of stories there as well in the written form. 
So please tune in next time. There's a new episode every Tuesday.